What's up, Rockstar family? We back with another video. You know, here time and time I share little stories about my story. Instead of always focusing on, you know, the gang, the prison, and stuff like that. And now, uh, some way or somehow, it still connects with all that stuff when I share my personal stories and stuff like that. Um, today I'm going to share a little bit about me, my story. My first really big connection I made and um, how it all went down. Remember, all this is going to be in my book plus other stuff, more into detail stuff. So uh, let's get into this. What's up, JC, wrong and strong. Hey, if you're new to my channel, make sure you subscribe. You don't miss none of my shenanigans. Hit that bell. You don't miss no videos. If you are part of my wrong and strong family, welcome back. What's up, Rasa? You know how it is. Subhase la Suburban, we're about to go on this ride. And today, you know, talk about me. I'm talk about call it JC story time I'll tell a little bit a little story about myself you know when I got out after being in Mexico and being in the feds in Texas and that bus ride home and then going to state prison after that uh, I finally came home and I was a little bit lost on the streets you know I was I was back in my hood didn't have nowhere to stay you know it was pretty much just running the streets and uh, the head guys, my, my, my leaders, I want to say back then, uh, you know, uh, would give me a plastic cr place to crash here and there. But, you know, it, it was because I was doing like dirty work for them. And, you know, uh, I was like the rug rat pretty much just doing whatever to survive and eat and, you know, be able to sleep somewhere. And... You know, I had made I had made some good friends in the in the Mexican prisons, and um, I had made uh, I had made impressions on people just because of how uh, how I was. You know, um, I look at it like this. You know, we all go through things, and we all do sometimes what we have to do to survive. But even if you have a drug addiction or a just a vice, whatever it is, it could be anything, women, money, it could be anything. You have a vice, uh, you can still carry yourself actually pretty decent, you know what I mean, to a certain point. And, you know, love and respect people and people still give you the same back. And I think that's what I did. I uh, came home, I was running the streets on Chicago on 59th Street, you know, sleeping here or there. And... You know, uh, the family that I was working for contacted me and they ended up giving me a truck and some money for, uh, you know, doing my time and, and keeping my mouth shut and just being a good worker. And, uh, you know, I thought I thought I was, I thought I was like set. I thought I was okay now, you know, because now I could run the neighborhood. I had a little bit of money to stay at a hotel if I needed to. Stuff like that, you know, and um, it's crazy how life is, is, is a ride, like a roller coaster, and, you know, things happen for a reason. 
A week later, I got a phone call from one of my close friends and acquaintances, uh, Ricardo. Um, he was in a prison that's in Mexico that is now closed, but back then it was a prison that held all federal cases. It's an island. It's an island surrounded in one of the most warmest waters, so there's a lot of sharks in that area. But the thing about that prison is they're all, they're all federal cases, right? So these are all drug dealers, drug mules, uh, big cases. You take your family to live with you there. Yeah, you heard me right. So if you got 20 years to do, you could actually take your wife, your kids with you and they'll give you a house and your kids will be able to go to school there. Your wife will be able to work. Um, there was, it's like a town. It was a town on an island, but you, you're able to do your time there. And actually, if your family goes with you, your, your, your sentence was reduced in half. So people that had 20 years had, only had to do 10. So they would take their families with them and live with them. And I mean, it was a, a pretty sweet place. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. When I got there and I seen the restaurants and I seen like all the girls walking around and you know, uh, it, it, it was a city. It was a small city. You know, people were out fishing, people were at the restaurants eating. And, and you know, you, the only thing that the inmates couldn't do, they couldn't buy, they couldn't buy cars, but you could tell who had the most money just by the, the bike that they drove, the, you know, off-road bike. They had some really expensive ones, the guys that had money and stuff like that. And the guys that had money had biz businesses. You know, they had, um, where well, they sold licuados, you know, shakes, uh, restaurants. Uh, I ate at, the whole week that I was there, I ate at this one restaurant by the shore that had like fresh f fish all the time, um, shrimp, uh, pulpo, all that stuff, and I, I ate there every morning. Now at the time, my boy Ricardo was actually dating one of the social workers from the prison. So they were allowed to actually date, inmates were allowed to date staff. That's pretty, you know, crazy. And they had, they had sections on, on, in the island where it was like the, the men that were uh, by themselves that didn't have family, like the bachelors, and the girls that were by themselves that were bachelorettes or whatever you call it, and the families. They had three units, three like towns. But on Saturdays and Sundays or during the week, everybody would come down to the main, main town and, you know, party and celebrate and... Um, you know, they would have mariachis, they would have dances and all this stuff. And I was like, when I got there off the boat, you know, when I got there, because the, the, the Marines are the ones that take you there. They search you, pat you down, blah, 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 take you to the island. And when I got there, the mariachis were going. You know, a lot of people were waiting for me because I had, I had a lot of people that knew who I was from my time that I did in Mexico. And, you know, one of those people were... I owed this guy $4,000 for, uh, he used to give me drugs on credit. You know, when I was in prison in Mexico, I actually had credit everywhere because they knew that uh, my people took care of me. They sent me money every month. I would get a thousand bucks every month wired to me in Mexico. It went a long, long way. I had credit at the store. I had credit at the uh, birria place at the, I mean, you name it. I had credit everywhere. I had credit with every drug dealer in that unit. There was 10 units. When I, when I left, I had a debt of $4,000 that was actually causing me a little bit of a, a issue, a problem, because I wasn't getting as much money as I, as I used to at the beginning because the family was upset that I was using drugs, so they cut me off. So I was getting here and there money sent to me, you know, and for me to actually like fly in and pay this debt was actually a really big thing in their eyes you know it showed a lot of a lot of respect but not only was i flying in just for that i was actually flying in for a sit down with a brother of one of the head guys of the uh night templares it, it was a cartel out of michoacan that uh 
you know, uh, back in the day, uh, was one of the biggest ones um, in that time. Uh, you know, I never realized that I, this is was going to be my first big, big connection into the, you know, drug world, drug game, whatever you want to call it. Because remember, you know, I, I started from the bottom. I started as uh, selling for somebody in Chicago um, on the corner, then to selling at a place, at a house. Then I went to being a mule. And then from being a mule, since they liked how I was actually like working and kept everybody in line, they made me the manager of the whole thing. And then little by little, I started moving up. But this was my first, first connection that was like really big. You know, I went to go talk to his brother, had to sit down, paid off the money that I owed, ended up, you know, coming. And I left. Let me let me tell you, I left Chicago like that same night when I got that phone call. I was still on federal probation, and I left. Went to Mexico, got on a plane, uh, you know, got on a boat, went to the island, came back, and then after I came back, I spent like two days in Mazatlan. Had to talk to some other people there, and then from there I went to El Aguaje, Michoacan, to go have this sit down with this dude, and. Um, I must have not even been there five minutes when I got off the taxi when the SUVs were already picking me up and taking me to his house. And it's crazy because his house looked like like a simple, simple, like a normal house. It just had the garage door, you went in. But once you walked in, there was a, a, a water fountain right in the middle of his house. It was like a mansion inside. And it was built like that, like a, like a fortress so people couldn't get in. He had lots of uh, maids and, and ladies working at the house. Uh, I'll never forget this dude because I built a really close relationship with him. And, you know, he trusted me a lot. Uh, this is this was my first first break into this business and into you know this line of work and you know it went well I ended up sitting down with him I spent a, a day with him next thing you know I was on my flight back to Chicago so here I am coming back to Chicago right still don't have nowhere to stay still don't have nowhere to live but I get my first break I get my first break and I get a taste of what that life really, really is, not being the middleman, not being the worker, not being, like being the wholesale distributor. <sighs> yeah, you know, it's crazy because I always say from rags to riches, right? And, you know, a lot of people ask me if I, if I miss that life. And, and by the way, on my first deal I made, I, I think, I wanna say about 76,000. They asked me if I miss it, if that and that, if I would change stuff. Honestly, I wouldn't change nothing because it's made me appreciate little things now or days that I do. Uh, one of them being, you know, being uh, humble with what I have, uh, being okay with things I can't change. You know, and I think that's been the biggest lesson that I've learned you know, I've learned a lot of lessons in my life in prison and everything. You know, I've learned to be patient. I've learned to work with what I got. But one of the biggest things that I've learned is not to worry about the things that can't change. And if I'm worried about the things that I can change, then change them and stop worrying about them. Do something about it. And that's what I mean. You know, I, I share my stories and, you know, my Everything, my falls, my ups, everything. Because I, I tell people sometimes, you know, I, I keep it 100. You know, when I was doing that whole diet thing last year and then my daughter got sick and everybody's like, oh, you're gaining weight. Why are you getting weight? I thought you are cutting, blah, blah. It's like, it's life, man. Life happens. And at that time, my daughter came first before anything or anyone. And that's how it was. And that's how it's always going to be. I'm always going to keep it 100 because I'm not I'm not lying to you. I'm lying to myself if I say that I'm doing stuff and I'm not doing it. Okay? So, you know, that's the one thing, man. It's like I tell you guys, wrong or strong is a family. If we can't keep it real with each other, then 
then what are we doing? Why are we doing this? I, I make these videos hopefully so I can reach somebody that is in that lifestyle or thinking about getting in that lifestyle and make them think that it's not worth it. It's not. It's not what it's cut out to be. Trust me, it's not. I've told you guys a million times when I had all that money and all that stuff, half of my hair was missing. I was a nervous wreck. I didn't sleep at night. I had to be high on drugs constantly. I did not have peace of mind at all. Today, I have peace of mind. I sleep at night. My conscience is clean. I'm not afraid to hear the doorbell or to hear a knock at my house. And again, I started from the bottom, but I did it right this time. I waited until I could drive. I bought my car as I waited. I turned my car in. Now I have a better one. I lived in a little shack for a while. I dated my baby's mom. It didn't work out. And it's just, it's called life. But you have to learn from it. You can't keep making the same mistakes. Trust me, I did it. I was the biggest fuck up ever. And I kept on trying to do the same thing, expecting different results. And it don't work like that. It's called insanity. My name is JC. I am Ron Strong. Don't judge nobody. Give somebody a hug. Stay in your lane and always leave, live savage. I told you. You have one life to live, but if you live it right, one life is all you need. Look at me. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy today. I'm happy about everything in my life. And it only gets better, guys. Like I said.